Rag and Bones Shorts, 1983. Written by Juliet Boyd. Narrated by the author. Copyright 2014, Juliet Boyd. Production Copyright 2021, Juliet Boyd. Nineteen eighty three. Rag looked down at the bouncer, who lay perfectly still on the polished tiles, not with regret, but with a hint of that showed you in his smirk. He kicked hard at the lifeless body. It flopped over, and the man's face settled staring straight up at him. The eyes were annoyingly expressive. The mouth was contorted into an unfinished scream. The impression it gave was a little like a monk painting. All it needed was the man's hands held up to the sides of his head to complete the effect. If you ignored all the blood still seeping from the multiple wounds on his body. He was still so fresh it was almost as if he were playing a game of lying down statues, waiting for the signal to breathe freely. This man would never breathe again. Rag glanced at the sign behind the ticket desk. It said, Welcome to the hippest happening place in town. Some welcome. Rag might have taken mercy on the bouncer if the man had been the least bit accommodating in his approach. But bouncers were rarely that. And this one had been no exception all brawn and no conversation. The problem wasn't what Rag was. The bouncer hadn't known that. The problem was that he had insisted that Rag wear a tie and not wear trainers. There were no signs on the wall about that, which Rag had been at pains to point out. Extremely politely, he thought. The truth was, his face didn't fit. The bouncers had been schooled to come up with some excuse, whatever was appropriate, for not letting in people they thought were likely to cause trouble. Unfortunately for Rag, bouncers were usually uncannily perceptive on that count. Rag didn't have a tie, but he had offered to take his trainers off if that would help. The don't-even-try-it look he'd received hadn't been called for. He'd been polite during the whole exchange, because he really wanted to dance. So much. Right there, at that particular club with its glitzy entrance, its flashing neon lights and its well-to-do clientele. Rag loved to dance. It wasn't something he had ever expected to like the first time he'd been dragged to a club. Dancing clubs hadn't existed when he was born, unless you were into formal, and creatures such as him weren't known for their desire to get on down. But it had become an obsession of his of late. It was the disco era that had pulled him in. He had liked nothing better than to dress up in a white suit, and strut his stuff on the dance floor. Things had moved on a bit since that fad, of course. Now the moves weren't quite as likely to knock someone else out if you happened to misfire with a thrust of your arm into the air. And he always preferred to dance before a meal. Of course, once he'd taken care of the unhelpful bouncer in typical creature fashion, thump, bite, suck, Another one had squirmed out of the woodwork. It was as if they were telepathically connected androids. Either that, or the first one had pressed a button under the counter. It might not have been the bouncer who did that, though. So after he'd dispensed of number two in similar fashion to number one, he had to make sure that the coat check girl was taken care of as well. He took pity on her snivelling and sent her home with her memory of the whole event compelled away. He didn't want to leave any loose ends. 
all for the sake of a tie and a pair of trainers. The people who had been in the queue behind him were gone too. He'd collectively compelled them to leave. Always a drain on the mental resources. When things had started to get heated. They wouldn't remember the argument. They wouldn't even remember being at the club. No witnesses equaled no crime, or at least no perpetrator. It was better not to draw attention too soon when a feasting was in progress, and he'd be gone before the police chanced upon the place. By the time he'd moved the bodies out of sight of the door, the thumping beat of the music was calling to him like a siren across the water. He couldn't resist. He bolted the entrance to the club and followed the music's call. A glitter ball flashed its hypnotic firefly lights around the club, highlighting faces for a second before moving on. The dance floor was, typically, much smaller than was required, and bodies were crowded onto it with barely a couple of inches between them. Perfect. That was just how he liked it. Up close and personal. And the less space the less likely his less savoury antics would be noted. Everyone would be bumping into each other, so much so that people were unlikely to turn around even if they did feel hot breath and a pinprick or two against their neck. It was going to be a good night for gorging. Rag pushed his way onto the floor and fixed his eyes onto a young woman with the kind of flicked-back, flowing curls that would have taken hours to achieve. He stared into her eyes and locked her gaze onto his, pulling her towards him with only the words in his mind. Dance with me, he said. And dutifully, she did. He pulled her so close that their bodies almost touched, but not quite and leaned his mouth in towards her neck. Don't scream, it's just a little nick. She tilted her head to the side to make his snacking easier, but he never got his fill. A large fist made contact with his face. He felt his nose crack over to one side, and an instant trickle of blood flowed down onto his lip. Rage thundered through his body. This was not the outcome he'd been looking for. All he'd wanted was a good night out. Before the man could withdraw his arm, Rag pinned it to a pillar with his fangs, biting deep and hard. The man screamed, and the people around them drew back. Rag let go and high-kicked the man in the face, fully restored from his earlier efforts. The distance the man flew through the air should have warned anyone else not to have a go. But they didn't seem to get the message. Maybe it was the dark, or the loud music that egged them on. Hands gripping tightly onto each of his arms only served to make Rag angrier. He drew the two men around front and smashed them against each other. They had little choice other than to fall to the ground, near unconscious. That was when it got really interesting. This one looks bad, sir. Rag tried to open his eyes, but his eyelids were still so swollen that all he could manage was to let a small slit of light in. The fight had been barely over when the emergency services had arrived and there had been no time for any repair of his body to take place. It needed a lot of repairing. Feigning victim was the easiest way out. The woman, a medic of some sort, wore a fluorescent high-vis jacket and held his wrist in her fingers. Can't find a pulse, but he's definitely breathing, 
very shallow but breathing. Pulsing air would have been a better description. The next thing he knew, his body was being dragged onto a stretcher and carried outside. He didn't have the energy to do anything about it, or the desire. True exhaustion wasn't something he often felt, but he had never had occasion to fight 50 or more men at once before, with them throwing punches from all directions and him responding as fast as he could. They just kept on coming. It had been so exhilarating. He felt his shirt being ripped open. The cool night air against his skin did nothing to ease the pain of healing. I can't see where his wounds are. Might not be his blood, I suppose. Shocking what too much alcohol can start. The other voice was male. He sounded older, although Rag couldn't be sure. He guessed he was on his way to hospital, which was confirmed when the wah-wah of an ambulance siren nearly pierced his sensitive eardrums. He hoped that by the time he got to the hospital, he would be strong enough to get up and walk away. Given how he felt, he wasn't overly optimistic about his chances. Bones turned off the radio and shrugged on his jacket. He had been listening to the news reports with more attention than usual. The incident that he'd just heard the details of had to be rag. It had all the hallmarks of a vampire on a bloodbender. Also, seeing as he wasn't back home basking in the glory of his exploits, Bones reckoned he still had to be in the thick of it. Either he was badly injured having already used up all the energy of the blood he'd consumed, or he was wearing a pair of handcuffs. Either way, he was pretending to be human, and that never ended well. Bones plumped for injured. Handcuffs would be no barrier to Rag getting away, however knackered he was. Bones sighed deeply. He was getting sick of having to extract Rag from situations he should never have gotten himself into in the first place. When he arrived at the club, Rag was being loaded into an ambulance. There wasn't anything he could do to intervene without an awkward conversation that would make no sense to the other party, or taking out the emergency team, which would harm the survival chances of the other patients and he wasn't prepared to do that. He assumed they were in a bad way, because that was the usual pattern with one of these outbursts. Rag's personal body count was increasing at an alarming rate, and most of it was just senseless blood sport, rather than fulfilling his nutritional requirements. Bones considered his options, he could hardly race after the ambulance as it sped through town. Well, physically he could, but it wasn't the most sensible thing to do if you didn't want to draw attention to yourself. He would have to take a less conspicuous route, but he needed to know where he was going. There were three hospitals in the city, but there was only one that was close to the club. Still, he couldn't take any chances. He noticed that the window to the driver's seat was open and focused his hearing in hard. Thank goodness for emergency crews having to report in. It didn't take him long to get the answer. He didn't take ground level. He climbed to the top of the nearest building and started to navigate the rooftops. There were some places where he couldn't jump from one to another and had to descend, even with his enhanced abilities. But it was the quickest route. But it was slower than an ambulance with sirens blasting. He hoped they didn't have time to do any investigations on Rag's body before he located him within the building. That wouldn't do at all.
I think he's got a concussion. I can't find anything else wrong with him, apart from some bad bruising. We'll keep him in overnight, monitor his signs and reassess in the morning. Can you get him up onto 3B? They have a couple of beds free. Rag's eyes were a bit further open now. The swelling had reduced and was little more than bruising, which was much more painful. Every time he tried to blink, it sent a dagger of pain straight to his brain. The voice of the young doctor who'd been attending to him sounded slightly panicked, probably because of the volume of casualties that were being ferried into the accident and emergency department at that very moment. He reckoned he'd downed at least half of the males in the fight and fed on just as many others, male and female. He laughed inside at the thought of someone claiming it had been a vampire attack because of the little pinpricks on their necks and the stick they'd get afterwards for suggesting such a thing. He hoped he was still around to witness that when it happened. A minute or two later, a porter came by with a trolley and he was manhandled onto it by a couple of nurses. He tried moving his arm onto his chest, but it felt like lead. Lead that had been hit with a sledgehammer hundreds of times. It was a long time since he'd been hurt this badly. In fact, he couldn't remember ever being hurt this badly. Not since he'd become a creature of the night. Usually, he knew when to quit if he was in an unwinnable situation. But he hadn't taken into account how confined a space the club was. And he hadn't done his research. He had no idea where all the exits were. And he'd locked the front door himself which meant that he'd never have been able to get out before someone had jumped him again. And breaking glass with your body was always a risky, don't-get-your-head-sliced-off option. However, the whole situation had been a great study on the effects of alcohol. It seemed that everyone, no matter how weak and feeble they were in their normal life, found strength in the stuff. And unerring courage... It was possible they thought he was wearing a costume. Or maybe they didn't even see his fangs because of the dark. He'd never know. He didn't intend having any contact with them again. Market research was for losers. He stared at the porter at the foot of the trolley, pushing him along the deserted corridor without a care in the world. And Rag's stomach began to rumble. There seemed to be no bounds to the amount of blood he could consume and still not feel sated. Good job there were plenty of humans to feed upon. Except at that precise moment, he needed a long straw with a needle on the end to partake. There was a good business idea. The ward he was taken to was dark and quiet, apart from the sound of laboured nighttime breathing of various other patients, hidden behind curtains. A nurse, or possibly a sister, as she acted all officious, wearing a navy blue and white uniform, pointed to where she wanted him to be deposited, and a minute later he was being reverse-engineered onto the bed. He still couldn't move his arm. The woman picked up his chart and stared at it for as long as it took the porter to trundle out of the ward with the trolley. She shook her head, looked down at him and tutted. But she made no comment directly to him. Nurse Bailey, can you do his vitals and settle him down for the night, please? Student Nurse Scarth, you can assist. And if you can manage to get him to tell you his name, all the better although I somewhat doubt he's going to want that on record. Yes, sister, came in chorus. The sister disappeared out the doors after the porter. Two nurses. What had he done to deserve that kind of attention? Things were beginning to look up. Maybe being in hospital for a short stay wasn't going to be so bad after all. 
He guessed that the student nurse was the one whose hands shook when she touched his arm. She looked really young, like she'd just got out of school or college or whatever it was they did before getting qualified these days. OK, we need to take his blood pressure. You do it and I'll watch. That's all right, isn't it, sir? If the student nurse takes your blood pressure for you. Rag realised the nurse was talking to him, but she wasn't really waiting for a response. She patted his hand as if that were his tacit agreement to the procedure. He'd never had his blood pressure taken and had no idea what it would involve. He gritted his teeth to stop himself from transforming as the student inflated the cuff around his arm so slowly that he could hardly feel the pressure increasing until it became uncomfortable. Her eyes focused in on the readout. The concentration with which she performed the task was commendable. OK, now take the reading and write it down here on the chart. But it's... The senior nurse had already moved on. It was probably just as well. He had no idea whether he even had a blood pressure that could be read, and the look on the student's face suggested he didn't. Focusing in, he could hear the student's heart beating so fast it was off the scale. This had to be the first time she'd done this. No one could be that scared of such a simple procedure. It wasn't like she'd put a needle in him, although he'd certainly have had something to say about that. He almost felt sympathy for her, if it hadn't been for her inviting-looking neck that was so pale it barely contrasted with the plain white collar of her uniform. He licked his lips. His stomach growled again. He knew she'd heard it because she looked at him, and a smile came over her face. It seemed to relax her. All she needed to do now was lean in and... He noticed a shadow contrasted against the vertical blinds on the window, on the opposite side of the ward. If it had been a bird, that wouldn't have made him jump. But the outline of a human form was a little more freaky. He knew he'd travelled in a lift, and that they'd gone up. That left two options. No, three. One... Bones had come to rescue him again, when he really didn't need rescuing. Two, an unknown creature just happened to be on the prowl and fancied a few decaying bodies to feast upon. Or three, they cleaned the windows at night. The last one wasn't likely, but neither of the others were good because they meant that his mostly enjoyable evening was about to come to an end. Bones moved quickly. He knew his body would be clearly silhouetted against the window blinds, because the moon was shining bright behind him, and the ward was dark. That wasn't good. All it would take would be one vigilant nurse to glance his way, or a restless patient who couldn't sleep and all hell would break loose inside. He was only a couple of floors up, so he could easily make the jump if it came to it, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to get inside the building and get Rag out of there before they discovered too much about him, or died trying. His plan was to get onto the roof and find a way in from there. If he took the normal route through the main entrance, there was no way they'd let him onto the ward at night. And anyway, it was highly unlikely they'd registered Rag under his real name. He wouldn't be that stupid. So it would be difficult to track him down by that method. Of course, there was always the possibility that he was unconscious and wasn't registered under anything yet. Bones pushed off again and managed to get a firm handhold on the edge of the roof. What he really needed to do when he got inside was to find a white coat. It was a bit of an overused cliché when it came to sneaking into a hospital, but he reckoned it was by far the best way to get onto a ward without attracting too many questions. 
but he had no idea of the layout of the hospital, or where the doctors got changed into their uniforms, or, the most important thing, which ward Rag was on. He decided he'd try to find a telephone before he went too far with his plans and call home, just to make sure his friend wasn't already back in the relative comfort of their house. There had to be an empty office in there at this time of night. Getting through the emergency exit door to the roof was easy enough. One swift kick with the power of a bulldozer did it, leaving it conveniently open for any further emergencies that night, and it led straight onto one of the hospital staircases. As he began to descend, the sound of his steps echoed. He tried to step lighter. It didn't make much difference, but as there were no other sounds, he guessed there wasn't anyone there to hear him. There were signs on the doors to each of the levels. He headed for the education centre on the top floor, looking for an unlocked door. He wasn't disappointed. He melted into the dark and dialed home, guessing correctly that it was nine for an outside line. Pretty standard. There was no answer. He wished there had been and that Rag's cocky voice had greeted him with a you where? Bones huffed out his frustration and returned to the staircase. He crept down one level. He pushed the door open and whispered, Rag, are you here? He waited for a response, tuning his hearing right into any sound at all. He pressed the door a fraction further and breathed in deeply to try to get any scent of his friend. He wasn't prepared. It was all he could do to stop himself from coughing. The aroma of a multitude of illnesses, mixed with disinfectant, was foul beyond belief. It was nothing like the aroma when they ended a human life. That was clean. That was instant. Plus, they rarely hung around. It wasn't like that when they killed other vampires, of course. He remembered the time they'd dispatched a 500-year-old specimen of blood-sucking evil to the other side and been floored themselves from the stench that filled their lungs. 500 years of decay in an instant. It had lasted for days as an unpleasant aftertaste because of the tiny particles of dust they'd inhaled as they gasped for unnecessary air in an attempt to get rid of it. These days... He always tried to find out how old a vampire was before he killed it, just so he was prepared to hold his breath, if necessary. Anyway, there was no hint of rag on level four. He went down another level and followed the same procedure. Once again, there was no answer to his call, but he did get the tiniest hint of rag's familiar scent and the other aromas on this floor weren't nearly so overpowering. He pushed the door open a little farther. If anyone saw him, he'd have to compel their memories away, but he didn't want to have to do that for the whole floor. That would take too much energy, and someone might raise the alarm before he'd caught them all. Then he'd have to abandon Rag. He looked at the signs on the doors in front of him and picked the one that said laundry. Not ideal, but whatever was. He picked through the bags of dirty linen until he found a white coat that only had a tiny splatter of blood on the sleeve and put it on. He looked down at his jeans and boots and wondered whether that was normal beneath the uniform attire for a doctor. He hadn't a clue. He tried to brush the creases out of the coat as best he could, hung his jacket up on a peg behind the door and stuffed his keys and wallet into his jeans pocket. He sighed. It was unlikely he was going to be able to pick that jacket up again on the way out. He really liked that jacket. He clicked the door to the laundry room softly behind him and breathed in rag scent again, full and long. Left or right? Definitely right. 
It seemed as if there were two wards on this floor, one at each end of the short corridor, and a few private rooms off to the sides. A set of double doors sectioned the ward off from the corridor with a small window in each. He peered through it. The nurse's station was a small office just inside the ward. There were two women in there. They looked like they were doing paperwork. The rest of the ward was quiet. He couldn't see Rag, but his scent was much stronger here. Bones was in no doubt that he was in the right place. But if he went in now, the nurses were bound to make enough fuss that it would wake everyone on the ward. Even he knew doctors didn't do rounds in the middle of the night. He moved back into the shadows and tried to work out a plan. But before he'd formed any ideas, he heard the nurses talking. He honed in. Oh, for goodness sake. What is it? They're supposed to keep this in A&E. Bones glanced through the window again. The older-looking nurse waved a small piece of paper in the air. It's their record that the patient went through their department. Look, you'll be all right for a minute if I take it down, won't you? If I leave it, it'll get forgotten, and then somewhere along the line there'll be a whole palaver to find it. I don't know, I... You're going to have to learn how to do it sometime. It's not so bad. They're all asleep. If something does happen, just shout across to A-Ward and they'll come. I'll let them know I'm going down. OK. Hey, smile. This is your vacation, remember? Yes, I know. You're right. I have to do it sometime. It didn't take a genius to work out that the nurse who was being left in charge of the ward was very inexperienced which meant she wouldn't be as confident on correct procedure. Which meant, well, Dr Jones would probably not be considered too out of place when he appeared on the ward in the middle of the night. Also, he now had an excuse if he needed it. He waited until the senior nurse had entered the lift and the doors had closed before he pushed the ward door open. He kept his voice low, and looked directly into the young nurse's eyes. She had gorgeous blue-grey eyes, and her hair was golden blonde, tied back and pinned up on her head. He imagined what it would be like if it was hanging down her back, and she was smiling up at him. But time was ticking. He lowered his voice to a whisper. When I leave this ward, you won't remember that I've been here. Even though he wanted her to remember him, he couldn't risk it. If only circumstances had been different. Show me the patient who was brought up from A&E. Which bed is he in? Certainly. He's over here. We don't know his name. He's in a bad way, but not serious. She approached one of the beds and pulled back the curtain. Rag spat his words out like a shot. What are you doing here? I don't need your help. Why do you always have to spoil everything? Shush. Can you walk? Bones said. Of course I can walk. Rag scowled at his friend as he lifted his legs over the edge of the bed and let them thump to the ground. Bones raised his eyebrows. Rag's legs still felt dead and uncooperative. Well, nearly. Another hour or two and... What did you do in that club? It's all over the news. And there was no way he was admitting how badly things had gone wrong to Bones. He was always far too ready to criticise. I had fun. Fun? You call ending up in a hospital bed unable to move fun? Maybe that had been the wrong word to use. Maybe not. It was certainly fun to tease Bones. I have two women fussing over me. What's not to like? He waved his arm towards the student nurse and winked. She lowered her head. 
Bones turned towards her and gently lifted her chin. You'll forget about him as well. Then he turned back to Rag. Don't even think about it. What? I can't even look at a woman now? No, you can't. Not when you're in danger. We need to get out of here. The other one will be back soon. She was only going down to A&E. Rag pushed on the edge of the bed, but he really couldn't make his legs straighten. He shook his head. It pained him to do it, but he had no choice. OK, so I do need some help. Bones grabbed him round the waist and lifted his feet clear off the ground. Rag's hospital gown flapped open. Hey, wait! My clothes! There's no time. No way! Hold it tight if you're embarrassed. I've had to leave my jacket. Think of it as a part of your punishment. Rag grabbed at the rear of the flapping gown with his fingers and scrunched it closed. Punishment? I haven't done anything wrong. No, you never do. He hadn't even noticed that during that last bit of conversation he'd been carried, still upright, out into the corridor. Bone stopped and looked back at the student nurse for what seemed like an extremely inappropriate amount of time, given the circumstances, although the sound of the lift moving got him going again. Rag's eyes widened. You fancy her, he said in as suggestive a tone as he could. No, I don't. Well, that was clearly a lie. Bones used Rag's body to push open the door to the stairs. Ow! Don't you think I've got enough bruises? Rag's foot caught against the banister as Bones turned to go up the stairs, jarring his leg painfully. This is not funny. It's not meant to be funny. Standing on the roof of a hospital in the middle of the night, with a hospital gown flapping in the wind, was not Rag's idea of a good night out. But that was where he found himself next, leaning against a chimney-like structure. Bones walked over to the edge of the roof and looked at the street below. He bent down and grabbed onto the brickwork. You can find your own way home. Don't wait too long, though. It's already three. The sun will be up in a couple of hours. Even with these skies, you'll get fried. Rag gasped. You're leaving me here? He lifted his foot and managed a stumble. You don't need my help. You said so. Now's your chance to prove it. This was unbelievable. But I can't walk properly yet. Then you'll have to find somewhere to hide until you can, won't you? And you'd better do it quick. Oh, and as well as daylight, they say there's a storm coming. Bones! Bye! Bones grinned at him before disappearing over the edge of the building. Rag looked up to the distant sky. A storm? Oh, yeah, a storm. The flashes of light on the horizon looked more like the wrath of some fictional god. Bones didn't feel in the least bit guilty about leaving Rag. There were plenty of places for him to hide on the roof. They weren't necessarily comfortable places, but they were places where the ultraviolet light couldn't reach his delicate skin. The storm was predicted to be one of those powerful enough to rip trees out of the soil and throw roof tiles to the ground like playing cards. He thought about the backless gown his friend was wearing that left his rear exposed to the elements. He couldn't help but laugh. In fact, he had a fit of the giggles, which he was sure Rag would be able to hear given that he was barely fifty feet away from his friend, down on the ground. He should have gone straight home himself, but in their journey from the ward to the roof, 
he had concocted another plan of action. He reckoned if the young nurse was at that very moment being hauled over the coals for losing a patient, then she might be emerging from the building in the not-too-distant future, dismissed early as part of some kind of disciplinary procedure. He could wait an hour and then leave. He wouldn't risk leaving it longer. He was in luck. Exactly half an hour later, when the rain was beginning to fall from the sky in big, globular drops, she exited from the hospital building in floods of tears. He didn't want to appear like a stalker, so he kept his distance. But he followed her all the way back to her house. It was in the student area of town. He took a note of the address and made his way home. Rag gritted his teeth and crawled into the curved metal structure on the hospital roof. He had no idea what it was, but it was the only structure with a bend in it where he could avoid direct light, and small ridges around it where he could grip with feet and hands. He didn't want to think about what it was, because he suspected it had something to do with air filtration and was a perfect place for things you didn't want to come into contact with. It wasn't that he could catch any human diseases, but he'd never been one who relished the thought of bacteria crawling across every inch of his skin, even though you couldn't see them. He tried to take shallow breaths, because the aroma wasn't pleasant, but he did need to be aware of what was around him, and that required air filtration of his own. The first close-up crack of thunder reverberated around his brain mainly on account of the metal structure that enhanced the noise tenfold. In addition to that, the pounding rain somehow managed to find its way around the bend to his hiding place. He was beginning to think that his choice of hideout hadn't been the best. A bolt of lightning hitting the metal could fry him as easily as a ray of sunshine, especially with the enhancement of water. He shuffled further down into the structure, until all that surrounded his body was concrete. Cold, damp, concrete. At that particular moment, he hated bones more than he hated the idea of true death. It was a long time since they'd had a storm that bad in the city. Storms of that magnitude were rarely natural. Not that the mortal population realised this. They might call them acts of God but the perpetrator was rarely good in nature. He was pretty sure there had been no talk on the grapevine of anything sinister on its way. Not, of course, that all supernatural creatures liked to announce their arrival. Most of them snuck up on you when you were least expecting it. The cover of a storm was always considered the best way to arrive, if you were from the dark side. It could hide a demon form in the blur of the rain and the flashing of the skies. It could diminish the appearance of breathing fire and the flash of a spell. But thinking that every storm hid something sinister could also send you crazy. He was already feeling crazy enough dealing with his current situation. Thinking bad thoughts wasn't going to help. Bones waited patiently. As he'd expected, not long after it became dark, there was a thump of an angry fist on the door. Rag was still wearing the hospital gown. Although it was tied somewhat tighter than it had been, it was still barely able to cover enough to make him decent. It was a good job he could run fast enough to be just a blur in the corner of a person's eye. On the plus side, he was no longer covered in bruises and scratches, so he'd healed properly but his eyes looked like he'd had a very little sleep. Bones stuck down as a fist made its way through the doorway first. Watch it, you don't want to get injured again. Rag kicked hard against the wall of the hallway and winced. Bones stepped back. Do you have any idea how many people's lives you ruined the other night? Why would I care? Seventy-three. Seventy-three people were taken to hospital. Some have injuries that'll keep them in for weeks. Rag laughed. 
They won't have to go to work. They should be thanking me. Really? That's what you really think? Look, I don't care what their lives are like. You should. You need to think first and act later. That's the way to keep our presence quiet. But you can't do that, can you? It's like you want people to know about us. Like you want them to start up vigilante groups to hunt us down and kill us. Do you want to die? Is that what you want? No. Bragg sneered. These people are too stupid to catch us. You think? You think every single person in this city is too stupid to work out what we are? You're living in a dream, Rag. Bones felt like banging Rag's head against a brick wall. So why did you go into a nightclub to attack 73 people? Rag flicked his wrist dismissively. I didn't, actually. I went into the club to dance, but they wouldn't let me in, so I made them let me in. Right, because that's how we do things. Out in the open, in public, so we can draw as much attention as possible. It's how I do things, OK? No, not OK. You're not some spoilt child having a tantrum. Anyway, how did not being allowed in end in the bloodbath you created? I was angry. I needed to calm down. So I used my charms on one of the ladies. Bones shook his head. And by charms, you mean you compelled her to pay attention to you? Yeah, so what? I didn't know her boyfriend was watching and was going to fight back. What exactly did you expect him to do? It was a disco. It was dark. I didn't think he could see. You didn't think he could see? Well, that explains everything, doesn't it? You could have backed off, apologised. He was the one who started the fight. He was too drunk to care about what I was. I had to defend myself. And you didn't think of simply walking away, or running? It's not like you can run super fast or anything now, is it? Rag's face darkened. No one's going to call me a coward. Bones rubbed at his forehead. He looked Rag up and down. There was no point. Rag was never going to back down and agree he'd done something wrong. He never did. He would always defend his position to the last. Act before you think. It ought to have been his motto. Go and put some clothes on. That didn't cause any argument. Rag disappeared up the stairs and was back in less than five minutes. He was all dressed up, ready for another night on the town. Bones couldn't believe his eyes. You can't be serious. Don't wait up for me. You're not my mother. The door slammed and less than half an hour after he'd arrived, he was gone again. Not his mother. He was more like mother, father, uncle and aunt all rolled into one. He still felt the responsibility that siring Rag had lumbered on him. That desperate decision that he'd made to save his friend. He did wonder, if they hadn't been friends before that, whether or not the bond would have been quite as strong. He always tried desperately not to use the I saved your life card when they had an argument. But it was difficult. When Rag was bad, he was very bad. He would have no problem annihilating a whole town full of people if he felt they were threatening him. And more often than not, they wouldn't actually be threatening. They would just be protecting themselves or their loved ones, much like what had happened the night before. What man wouldn't stand up to the plate if their girlfriend was being hassled by another man? It would be unusual if they didn't. He shook his head to try to knock all thoughts of Rag out of his mind and picked up his keys. He had his own plans for the evening. Surveillance was his priority. If Rag came back before him, he'd just have to wait. Or break in. It was his own fault for neglecting to keep a track of his keys, which were probably in the locker by his hospital bed. 
Bones knew it was silly, this obsession he was beginning to develop about the nurse. There was no way he could have a proper relationship with a mortal. There were too many problems involved in that kind of relationship. He'd tried it before, more than once, and it had ended in disaster. Even when a mortal accepted who you were, things were never plain sailing. But he'd been intrigued by her. There was something about her eyes when he compelled her that drew him in. It was almost as if she'd seen inside his soul. Which was ridiculous, because there was no such thing as a vampire with a soul. Or so it was said. The last remnants of his soul were ripped out with the first feed he'd had. It was the only way to cope. But still, he had felt something. He made his way to the student quarter by bus. He quite liked the leisurely pace of urban transport. It gave him time to look at his surroundings properly. If he took a vampire route or used his super speed, he missed all of that. Early evening the buses were usually almost empty and he could have a double seat all to himself, especially if he spread his arm across the back of the second seat. Who would want to sit down in that situation? Thursdays were unusual nights. They weren't quite the weekend when everyone would be out and about forcing themselves to have a good time on the couple of days they had off from work each week. But it was busier than earlier in the week. It was like people were practising for their big weekend blowout by having just a couple of drinks or going to the cinema. He hoped that the target of his affections would be doing the same, but it was unlikely. She would probably be working the night shift again. When he hopped off the bus, he couldn't believe his luck. He didn't even have to walk the two streets to her house. There she was, not in uniform, coming towards him, with two men shielding her on either side. He felt a spike of jealousy. She was clearly on a night out. Bones backed into a shop doorway and listened in. The student nurse and one of the men started to talk. Where are we going? she said. Where do you want to go? the man on the left said. He was taller than her and a little ragged looking. She tapped at her bag. Somewhere cheap. I've got ten pounds to last to the end of the month. It's okay. I'll shout you a drink. No, Roger, you won't. You've already bought me too many drinks that I can't pay you back for. Roger. Bones wanted him to be over and out. Well, if you'd agree to be my girlfriend, that wouldn't be a problem, would it? Don't. So, she didn't have a boyfriend. Bones couldn't help but smile. Hey, you two. I am here as well, you know. The other man was shorter, with glasses that kept falling down his nose. Where do you want to go? she asked. How about Reno's? There's a band on later. Some guys from uni. I hear they're not too bad. She snorted. Not too bad? That's a great recommendation. It's better than they don't suck. Roger grimaced. Marginally. OK, Reno's it is. Reno's. Bones hadn't been there before, but he'd heard of it. It was a place where students tended to hang out because the beer was cheap and the entertainment was free. To be honest, it wasn't the kind of place he was used to. He preferred somewhere a bit more upmarket, where you could sit down at a table and your feet didn't stick to the floor. The thought of having beer spilled down his jeans and cigarette burns on his jacket, his new jacket, made him feel nauseous. But if he wanted to get to know the girl, to test out the water... This was how it was going to have to be. He left a short distance between him and the group as they made their way to the pub. There was no mistaking the place. It was heaving. There was already loud music playing, not live, and a rowdy bunch of over-imbibed patrons on the pavement. People being worse for wear that early in the evening didn't bode well. Bones waited a full ten minutes after they'd entered the pub before he approached the door. 
not because he thought they'd noticed he was following them, but because he really was having second thoughts. Are you going in or what? He turned to see Rag, grinning at him. Did you follow me? Rag moved in front of him and wagged his finger in Bone's face. More to the point, did you follow her? There was no way Rag would have seen his cheeks redden, but he would have sensed the quickening of his heartbeat. You really do fancy that nurse, don't you? So what if I do? It doesn't mean I'm going to do anything about it. Yeah, that's why you're here. It's called stalking. Come on. Rag grabbed his hand and dragged him forcefully over to the door of the pub. There were no bouncers in this place to stop them getting in, but there was the customary welcome sign inviting them to join the throng. The place was more packed than a sardine can with a double portion of sardines. It was impossible to find anyone unless you happened to bump into them as you forced your way through. The queue for the bar was ten deep, and because of the squeeze of bodies, there was no chance of being able to compel yourself forwards without creating a parting of the seas effect, which would draw all the attention to them. Bones growled in frustration, but no one could hear him. Let's just forget it, he shouted to Rag and turned to leave. What, you're giving up already? He raised his hands as best he could in the confined space. What's the point? It's not like we could talk in here. She can't tune into my voice. Bones pushed his way back out to the entrance, and Rag followed him. He breathed in the cool air outside to clear his lungs of the smoke, and then he did a double take. They gave up as well, he said pointing to the group of three people walking towards the centre of town. Then what are we waiting for? The two of them followed, at a reasonable distance, for a good fifteen minutes, until they arrived at a traditional-style pub on the corner of a residential street. No mass of students, no music, no crush. Rag pushed open the door and a blanket of smoke-filled air hit them in the face. It was even worse than Reno's. Don't worry, your lungs will repair, Rag said, a glint in his eye. But theirs won't, Bones said. Just get me a lemonade, I want to keep a clear head, and you might be as well doing the same after your recent escapade. Lemonade, are you serious? I'd rather... Yes, I'm serious. Don't worry, I'll get them. The barman graciously donated them two soft drinks, which they took to a table a couple along from where the student nurse and her friends sat. Now keep quiet, Bones said. I need to concentrate. Rag drew a zip across his mouth, closed his eyes and leaned back against the wall behind him. Bones focused his hearing in on the table where the three friends sat. But if the ward sister said it wasn't your fault, they can't put it in your assessment, can they? Well, they suspended me. I'd say that's a pretty good indication. I was the one there when it must have happened, but I swear I didn't see or hear anything. It was like he disappeared. One minute he was there, the next he was gone. The thing is, I don't even remember the man. The other nurse said I took his blood pressure, but I don't have any memory of it at all. It's like a whole half hour of my life just disappeared. Bones gulped and not on the drink. He hadn't wanted her to be in that much trouble. He hadn't thought it through properly. He hadn't thought it through at all. I reckon, Roger said, leaning back and raising his eyes to the ceiling, it was an alien abduction. Don't laugh, Nige. They do happen. I'm convinced of it. Ellie believes, don't you? So, her name was Ellie. Bones rolled the sound around his head a few times. It was warm and comforting. And comfortable. Oh, well then, if we're going for the most unlikely scenario we can think of, Ellie said. Maybe he was some kind of demon. I mean, according to the notes, he'd been beat up in the club, but he didn't seem to have any lasting damage. 
Bones gulped again. Did these people really believe in the supernatural? Or were they joking? A vampire, Roger said, slapping his hand on the table and creating a tidal wave in his glass of beer. Yes, Ellie clicked her fingers, pulling thoughts out of the air. Because they can repair their bodies, can't they? He was a vampire and he did that thing. Oh, what's it called? Where they can make you do stuff that you can't remember. Compelling? Offered Nige. Yes, that's it. He was a vampire and he compelled me not to remember that he'd been there. Better not suggest that to Sister, though. I'm not sure it'll go down well. Nige laughed. You two are completely bonkers, you know. You should go out with him, Ellie. You're the perfect match. Two weirdos together. Roger put his arm around Ellie's shoulder and squeezed her tight. What do you say, Ellie? She lifted his hand off her shoulder. The same as I always say, we're better as friends. Anyway, it would make it awkward for Nige at the house. Nige raised an eyebrow. Ha! Don't involve me in your excuses. Roger took a sip of his beer. So you'd like to be a gooseberry, would you? Well, I may have my eye on someone myself. Ellie bounced in her seat. Really? Who? Hell, this is boring, Rag said. Bones hissed at him. Boring? They more or less described how you got out of the hospital. No, they didn't. They made no mention of an accomplice. A minor detail. Bones hesitated, but said what he was mulling over. Do you think they really believe in vampires? Hmm, well, I think they like making up silly stories, but I don't think they'd be all that happy if you bared your fangs at them. Go on, go over there now and do it. See what their reaction is. Don't be ridiculous. Rag pushed his shoulder. Go on, you can always compel them to forget. Go over there, make sure they're looking at you, and do it. No. Bones tried to drag his eyes away from Rags, but he was too slow. He knew what his friend was about to do, and he couldn't stop it. Because he knew he really wanted to know the answer, and that made him weak to the power of Rags' suggestion. Rag always liked to push the boundaries, however impolite it was. Go and reveal yourself to them. Bones stood up and walked over to Ellie's table. He stood in front of the three students for a second, making sure he had their attention. Then, staring into Ellie's eyes, he let his eyes flash black and he bared his fangs. Before Roger could shout out, he had forgotten. The same with Nige. But Ellie kept his gaze when he returned to look at her. Her mouth gaped a little, and her eyes were wide. But there was no fear. Make her forget, Rag whispered in his ear. I don't want to. Make her forget. He commanded Ellie's mind to forget his existence, but he knew he'd be back to see her. He had felt her acceptance of what he was. True acceptance, deep down within her. An acceptance she probably didn't even understand she had. It wasn't something he could ignore. Do it, Bones said. He pushed Rag forwards towards the inquiry's desk in the hospital foyer. What if the police are looking for me? We'll deal with that if it happens. Rag knew he wasn't going to get away with not doing what Bones wanted without a big scene. Bones had got him here under false pretenses, those being that he wanted to make sure Ellie, he was referring to her by her first name now, was back at work. He had said nothing of confessions until they were in the building. The woman at the desk was all smiles, even though she'd probably had a full day of doing the same and the muscles in her mouth were aching with being pleasant. This was the desk where all the complaints would come, even if that wasn't what it was there for. 
The only good thing was that there were very few people around as the dark of night had descended. Hi, Rag said. Yes, sir, how can I help you? I'd like to speak to someone about a patient who was admitted to the hospital on Wednesday night. You can speak to me. What is the nature of your inquiry? It's just... He looked back towards Bones, who mouthed a go on at him. The patient was me. I was admitted, but I discharged myself without telling anyone in the middle of the night. I snuck out past the nurse. I just didn't want her to get into trouble, that's all. The woman frowned. Oh, that's unusual. But I'm sure the staff will be grateful to know. Do you know what ward you were on? No, but I know it was on the third floor. And your name? They didn't have my name. I was brought in unconscious. The woman's eyes widened. And you left? Sir, have you been checked over since then? I'm fine. No, seriously, I mean, I'm no medical expert, but... I'm fine, honestly. Just make sure they know it wasn't the nurse's fault, will you? Rag was unable to read her change of expression, but her mind gave him everything he needed to know. Well, yes, of course, but... Rag turned and started to walk towards the entrance. Sir! He growled at Bones. We need to get out of here or she's going to call someone. Did it work? I don't know, but I sure as hell seem suspicious. And you know what? When they look back at the footage, they're going to think she's lying. Bones looked mortified. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Do you think they'll have a camera? I don't know, but I would. Stop looking, let's just get out of here. Rag waited for exactly the right moment. His muscles were tensed, all set to pounce from the branch of an old oak tree. His fangs were out and ready for business. She stepped off the bus, her coat wrapped tightly around her, and her hands stuffed into her pockets. Her steps were quick as if she really wanted to get home. Who wouldn't after working in a hospital till after dark? When she was ten feet from where he perched, he let his body drop down to the pavement. She stopped dead in her tracks and looked at him. She shook her head. Can you either stop doing this or attack me, one or the other? I'm tired. I need to get home and get some sleep. Changing shifts is a killer. Rag didn't speak for a second. What she said didn't make sense. Yes, he'd jumped out in front of her a number of times over the past week. But every time he'd forced her to forget. It was kind of an experiment to see how accepting she'd been when Bones finally revealed to her what he was. Bones didn't know about it, but he was going to thank him for it one day. You remember me? Well, you've done this at least half a dozen times. It isn't exactly normal behaviour. No, but... Look, the costume's great. It'll go down well at the next Halloween party, but not now, OK? She started to walk past him. He grabbed her shoulder. It was a dangerous move, but he needed to find out the truth. Get your hands off me or I'll scream. You remember me? I told you that already. Now let me go and don't do it again. He took his hand away. She began to walk along the street. But then she turned back. However, if your hunky friend wants to try, my response might be different. No way. No way, no way, no way, no way. No one was immune from compelling unless they were part of a very select group of those from the supernatural world. It was impossible. Never, ever, ever had he heard of such a thing. Never! She had to be hiding something.
I'm telling you, she wants to see you and I don't think you should. Bones rounded on Rag. And I'm asking you what you were doing there in the first place. I told you I was testing her out. I was seeing if she was scared of creatures because she sure didn't look it in the pub. Are you even listening to me? Are you listening to me? She can't be compelled. She remembers you. She knows you stood in front of her and did the fangs thing. She's abnormal. She might be some kind of demon herself. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not true. Rag was right. That wasn't normal. But he wasn't about to admit it. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Why would a demon want to be a nurse? To hide their identity? I think it's a pretty good cover. What if... What if she gets her power from people dying? Have you thought of that? I'm sure that has to be a thing. Yes, it probably was. Rag, have you listened to yourself lately? Rag grabbed his arm. Go and see her. Prove to me that I'm mad. I'm telling you now, she remembers you and she says she likes you. It could be a trap, but don't listen to me. Find out for yourself. You're the one who has all the answers. It was completely ridiculous. It couldn't be true. Rag was either confused or going insane. He'd heard of that. Vampires who lost their minds and ended up doubting if they even existed. And none of what Rag had said had put him off. He still wanted to see Ellie again. He stomped up the stairs, slammed his bedroom door and didn't get one wink of sleep. That evening he sat quietly in the pub and waited. He'd been there every night for the past five weeks and she still hadn't appeared. He was getting sick of lemonade and the barman gave him funny looks every time he went up. He had his cover story and his paperwork sorted. He'd paid a premium rate for that from a demon who had few scruples and very little in the way of social abilities. He was now officially a student on a BA in history, first year, and he had all the completed assignments and textbooks to prove it. The tutor was under the impression that he'd attended all the lectures and was updated on his false memories every week. Unfortunately, Bones had none of the knowledge to back all this up. It didn't matter. He still waited. Sooner or later, Ellie would come back and he would be there. And if Rag's ramblings were correct, she would remember him. He wasn't counting on that. He was just another student of the many thousands in the city and until she saw him again, he would remain under the radar. The barman rang last orders. Ellie walked through the door. She saw him immediately and walked towards his table. Her demeanour oozed confidence, unlike his. She sat down next to him. So, she said, are you and your friend really vampires, or is it all some elaborate hoax? Rag entered the library. It was only half an hour before closing time, but he reckoned that would be just about long enough for what he wanted. Not that he'd done any research before. He wasn't a books kind of creature. The library wasn't a building he'd ever been in, and he hadn't the foggiest idea what he was going to look up. It wasn't like there were shelves of books dedicated to vampire powers and how people could resist them. At least he would have been surprised if there were. He headed for the microfiche machines and then immediately changed his mind. He had no clue how to use one. This was a bad idea. A ridiculous idea. It was up there with jumping off a skyscraper to see if it killed him. He hadn't done that yet, but he had seriously thought about it. He turned round and walked back through the barrier and towards the exit. Can I help you? The voice came from behind him. There was no one else in the foyer area of the building, so he turned back towards the desk. It's just you seemed like you were going to get a book and then you left. I know libraries can be a bit daunting if you don't know how to use them. I could help if you like. She was quite young, probably less than twenty, but she already had the typical librarian look. Large glasses perched on her nose, hair tied back in a severe ponytail, clothes that had never been in fashion. 
but she had the loveliest smile. I don't think you'll have what I need, he said. It's quite specialist. Try me. There was no way he could out and out ask her, not in a way she would remember. It's kind of silly. The sillier, the better. Still, he couldn't let her remember. He looked into her eyes and touched her mind. I need to find out what could prevent a vampire from being able to compel a human to do something. Or forget what had happened. Find me the information without telling anyone else what you're doing, and then forget that you were ever asked. The girl held her hand up to her mouth. But it didn't stop the giggle from erupting. She leaned over towards her colleague, who was checking out books on the other side of the counter. Hey, Liz, do we have anything on vampire law? Vampire? Are you serious? Don't worry, I'll sort it out. She placed her hand on his on the counter. It's all right. You don't have to worry about being a vampire. I can remember everything you said. Rag turned away as his eyes flashed black. Again? Something was stopping everyone from succumbing, not just the nurse. What had happened to change things? He'd had no problems at all at the club. But ever since then, well, he'd only tried it with the nurse himself. But something was severely affecting his ability to influence others. And he needed to find out what. He stepped out into the street to the sound of continued giggles. It was deserted apart from one woman who seemed rather skimpily dressed for the time of year. Her lacy skirt flapped in the wind, as did her long dark hair. She was imposing for sure, especially when she turned towards him and lifted her palm up in front of her body. You and all your kind will no longer have the ability to influence the women of this city in ways they do not wish to be influenced. No longer will they be stripped of their ability to remember your heinous behaviour towards them. Remember my name, for you will hear it again. Adriel is queen of this domain now, and you'd do well to remember it. Before Rag could react, she had disappeared. Panic filled him. He needed to get to Bones before he made contact with the nurse, because... If what this woman had said were true, Bones would never be able to make her forget what he did. Memory was dangerous. Memory of a vampire could be fatal. The End <laughs>